Good morning or afternoon or evening, wherever you are. Um, thank you for joining me at this deep dive. Uh, today I'll talk about materials, code, and data transparency. And I, I'm going to talk, maybe take a little bit more time than you thought talking about why I think we should be transparent. Um, and then um, also take some time on how you can do this in real life. Um, so my name is Willa Van Dyke. Uh, currently, I'm a Dean's postdoctoral scholar at Florida State University in the Department of Psychology, and I'm affiliated with the Florida Center for Reading Research. Uh, and this is in Tallahassee, Florida, where it's currently sunny but not warm. Um, in my work, uh, I focus on preventing reading failure in young children by understanding individual differences in reading development, effective interventions, and effective teachers. Um, I use a lot of advanced quantitative methods in my work, and um, I try to adhere to open science practices, and I do my best to uh, use these practices in educational science and promote them as well. Um, I'm currently funded through LDBase, uh, which is an NIH grant here at uh, FCRR with Drs. Hart and Schatzneider, and we are building a data repository that's specifically for achievement and behavioral data uh, for students with learning differences or about learning differences. And so that's really my big open science um, assignment in these last two years that I've, that I've been here at Florida State. Um, I have slides and materials available on the OSF project page for this talk. There's a link here, um, and you can find me on Twitter at Willa Van Dyke. Um, I tweet stuff about my life as a researcher. Sometimes that is fun, and sometimes that's not so great. So. Um, when people ask why we should share data, I um, often will start with the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, it brought us these awesome pictures from the universe. Um, here we have star cluster NCG602 here on the left top. We have uh, HH24, also called the lightsaber. We have the Orion Nebula, the Sombrero Galaxy, there's just all these amazing images um, that came from NASA and the Space Telescope, Space Telescope Science Institute. Um, and I think a lot of you have seen these pictures or other famous pictures that came from the Hubble Telescope um, in its last 31st, that, that's 31 years of existence. They're almost celebrating their 31st um, anniversary. I wasn't gonna say birthday, but that doesn't seem right. Um, the Hubble, however, the, as a project is much more than these pretty pictures. So we're in, or they're in their 31st year. In these 31 years, this telescope has made over 1.4 million observations. With these observations, 17,000 peer reviewed studies have been published that generate about 150 citations daily uh, with a total of almost a million citations. Um, the, it has these famous images that are across every astronomy textbook uh, in the world. It generates 150 gigabits of raw science every week with a total archive of 150 terabytes of data that is available to everyone, openly available to the public. Um, so if you would go to the Hubble uh, website, you can go and download data from the Hubble telescope. Um, the only restriction is if there's an um, a ongoing project that, so researchers can kind of book time in, this, in the telescope, uh, it will gather data for them, and they have a year to use that data to, to um, do their analysis and write up their papers. And then after a year, all the data is freely available to everyone else. So it's um, a clear 
to me, that open sharing of data has generated this insane amount of peer-reviewed articles and publications. Um, if you were a young astronomer without any money to do any observations, you can go to the Hubble data um, hub and get data and write your papers, which I think is amazing. Um, if you like to, you know, fun up your Twitter feed a little bit sometimes because it can get a, what drab lately. Um, follow these fun Hubble um, um, accounts to get like astronomy in your feed. It's kind of fun. Um, and, but besides um, the Hubble, which is you know obviously one of the best. Um, examples. We have some good examples in education uh, or developmental psychology uh, fields. So a, a very good example is the talk bank system of which the child's is um, a subcomponent. And I don't know if you're familiar with child's, but it's a language data bank. Um, it has currently 230 corpora, including 30 different languages. Um, there's about 3,100 peer-reviewed papers that have been written with data from uh, TalkBank and Childs. It has over 4,000 users, and again, this data is openly available to the public um, at, the, at that website. Um, and when I think about this, the, the Hubble and also this Childs data set, there's, I mean, there is a way that, you know, 230 investigative groups could have written 3,100 peer reviewed articles. But it seems to me very unlikely that in, you know, 10 years, each of these groups did over 15, 15 um, articles. So there's just a lot more to be done with data than one researcher can do by him or herself. Um, a lot of has already been said about the benefits for specific fields of science in general in regards to transparency and sharing. So for example, it's the idea that new, new ideas will be generated faster and those ad ideas will then um, advance the specific field we're talking about faster. Um, it will increase transparency in the research process. Um, maybe people have limited trust in other people's science and the more you share, the, the more transparent it is, the more people will believe in your trustworthiness. Um, increase in collaboration that comes through sharing your data or your science with other people. But what I really wanted to focus on and talk to you about today for a while is um, the fact that I think transparency helps promote equity in research. And what I mean with this more specifically is that by, by sharing your data, your materials, your code, you can support graduate students who don't have resources. You can support early career faculty, faculty from, from underrepresentative groups um, in I'm going to say education, but if you're in a related field, in any field, um, or faculty and groups at under-resourced under institutions. And you can help them to get learning opportunities and research opportunities. And, and that will be kind of the first part of today's talk, is to share experiences that I have had throughout my career, which is not very long yet, but hopefully will become um, continue for another couple of decades. Um, after that, I want to talk about tips and tricks for sharing materials, code, and data if you have a new project. And then I was going to do this, but actually it's only one slide, and that's what, what you do when you share elements of a project that um, has already finished or is already started. So I want to start with my experience with transparency and how this has paved the way for my journey to the stars. I hope. I hope it will be to the stars. Um, 
So my first encounter with transparency was during my master's degree, and I actually saw that my um, mentor for that project is on our talk today. Hi, Pam. Um, I was planning my thesis study with her um, in special education, and I read this article with an intervention that I thought was just amazing. Like, I may have just been a little bit in love with this study. Um, I really wanted to replicate the study. I was super excited about it. Um, I read the article, you know, many times. I made notes. Um, it had a fair amount of details, but I was unsure about some of the key elements and how to address these elements. And so I decided to email this author and ask for more details. Uh, and I think, you know, I was a master's student at this time. I think that's a bold step to email somebody that you, you've read their work, you're super excited about it, you're just kind of like in awe about this person. So I emailed them, that was scary. Um, I was really pumped with all the adrenaline. <laughs> I waited a couple of weeks, I didn't hear anything. I was like, oh, I don't know. Turns out she wasn't actually at this institution anymore, but you know, I just used the email that was on the article and I didn't check it. So I emailed her again at her current email address, and finally we got a response back. Um, and that response um, said, no, I will not give you more details because my intervention has been copyrighted and you can't do this. And so I was a little stunned and disappointed and sad. Um, I deliberated with uh, my mentor. Um, we emailed once more to, you know, kind of talk about replication. Um, that didn't work out so well either. And so we decided just to drop it and do it anyway with the information that was in the article. Um, so I kind of filled in the blanks from the article with what I thought should be happening at that time. Um, I completed my study, you know, I graduated, it was all great, but I was a bit disillusioned about the field and how we talk about doing interventions. And if you're not allowed to replicate anything, how would we know if an, an intervention is really gonna work? Um, it was my impression we are all here to help children. So if somebody wants to replicate your work and help other children, I thought that would be great. But apparently not everybody um, thinks the same way. Anyway, I graduated. I moved on to a PhD program and I soon forgot all about this incident because I was busy with, you know, doc student things. So I'm gonna fast forward to my third year in my PhD program. I was taking an advanced class in um, structural equation modeling, and I needed to do an applied project as a final using one of the measured me methods that were part of the course in this semester. I really like statistics. Yay, statistics. I love statistics. But if you know something about complex structural equation models, you know you need a large data set for that. Well, I'm in special education. We don't have that much large data because sometimes it's only like 10 kids with my particular problem. So um, lucky for me, one of my faculty advisors at um, in my doc program did a lot of secondary data analysis and he helped me get access to one of the data sets from the National Center for Teacher Effectiveness main study that's um, publicly available through ICPSR. Um, you do have to apply for it to get it. Um, he was affiliated, and so I, I was able to work on that data set. So that was my, my one problem solved. I had some open data to work with, um, and I thought, well, that's great. I'm set now. But then I remembered I actually had to model something pretty complex, and um, I didn't really know how to model this. So what I did was try to find some example papers that use the same type of model and see if they, anyone shared their code in M plus so that I could kind of adapt it to what I needed. Um, and I didn't find anything. So sad Willa, 
um, spend a lot of time kind of Googling this model and trying to find, figure something out. Uh, eventually I figured the model out and it was, it was good, but I definitely had some headaches um, over this modeling and not being able to find any of the code. Um, so that was another kind of sad story when people don't share stuff. Um, but it can be different. So last year during my postdoc, um, I really experienced the benefit of code sharing. So we're working on integrative data analysis problems uh, that have to do with the data repository and how we want to connect different data sets and make it into a big data set. <clears throat> and um, Dan Bauer, who is one of the people behind IDA, actually does post code on his website. Um, and it's more than just code. As you can see, it's kind of scribble, but he has annotations in his code. So this is the code that goes with one of their original papers. And I have the citation here below. And he actually goes through and tells you what each of these elements are. And so I was like, level up, this is amazing. I can just copy this, adapt it to the variables I have, and run this pretty complex model. And I'm kind of learning about how to reparameterize things in this model. And it was amazing. I learned so much. And all you had to do is go to his website. So that was really, for me, a moment where I was like, oh my gosh, this would have taken me like a year to figure out by myself. And this um, professor just has it on their website and you can learn from it. And it was an amazing feeling to be able to do this pretty complex model um, by kind of following along with his code. Um, so that's sharing code with people. Um, I'm going to jump back a little bit because I want to also talk about this sharing of data. Um, I'm going to back up to my last year in my doc program because I had this brilliant idea for my dissertation. You all know this feeling. It was going to revolutionize my field. This is going to be like I was going to win so many awards for this dissertation. It was going to be awesome. I had it all figured out. I had it written up. I knew exactly what I needed to do. The problem was this project needed a lot of data from a lot of kids. Um, I am a fourth year doc student, don't have any grant funding or anything. And so my advisor was like, no, we're not doing this because you don't have time and you don't have money to pay other people. And so I'm sorry, but your brilliant idea has to go on the shelf until you get a real job and you have people doing stuff for you. So another kind of um, sad day for me. Um, and I had some stressful weeks after she said that. I am grateful for her because it would have never worked out and it probably still would have been working on this project right now, two years later. Um, but it was some stressful weeks afterwards to decide well, what am I going to do then? Like if I want to do secondary data analysis, if I can't collect this, these data myself, where am I going to get these data? Um, and so I got very lucky. Oh, <laughs> sad. I got very lucky um, because um, Mike Coyne, who is in this picture, a professor at University of Connecticut, had a big data set. Uh, he's a friend of one of my committee members, so he had a boatload of data, and they were okay with me using these data. And so I was super excited about that and very grateful. Um, the only catch they had was that I could use the data, but then I also had to clean this data set. If you've ever cleaned the data, I see some people like snickering already. If you've ever cleaned somebody else's data set, <laughs> you know, that took me a while, a couple of months, but I got it done. Um, and I was able to use these data, which was amazing. Um, I did my dissertation. I graduated. I didn't win any awards for this dissertation, but it was fine because it got me this job that I have right now, um, my postdoc. 
about open science and I really got into this idea of sharing your data openly and, and doing things with it so other people can learn. Um, I must say, if you're not on Twitter, you should be because that's where I found my job as a postdoc um, and it's amazing. Um, so this was my totally anecdotal end of one account of why you should share stuff to help other people and improve equity. I know it's really not representationable and probably not generalizable to the other public, but I really wouldn't be where I am today and obviously invested in open science if I hadn't experienced what a lack of transparency means and being able to compare that what having transparency means um, for my science um, and in general. Um, I, you know, really valued this idea of not, not having code that is transparent and trying to really figure out how that works by yourself and contrasting that with code that's readily available that you can learn from even if you're not in this person's class um, and or, or spending <laughs> loads of time at your statistics professor's office hours every week I, i'm pretty sure dr lechi was like are you here again i was like yeah i really need to know how this works now um, and I really noticed what it can do for you if you have a research question and somebody else has data that you can use for this question. Um, so you don't have to spend resources that either you don't have, or why would we even expand or spend all these resource, resources and time of kids that I needed to assess and time of the assessors to get data that somebody else already has. It seems just like a waste of time um, and for people like me who didn't have those resources, um, I think that's very important because it was enabling me to do what I wanted and not having me set back um, by not having that opportunity. So I think that transparency really can help early career research, research, researchers and faculty at underrepresentative institutions or under resourced institutions or from minority backgrounds, um, because we do know that, you know, resources with researchers with disabilities um, and from minority backgrounds have lower chances of getting grants, for example, to do their own um, experiments. And sometimes that can also be because you didn't have the opportunity to collect pilot data and you also need resources for that. And so I think if we um, share our stuff with other people, we give them the opportunity to become better resource re researchers. Sorry, I keep saying resources instead of researchers. That's annoying. Um, and I think that will help the equity in our field where not a bunch of people get all the money and all the things and here's the rest of us just kind of sitting around because we didn't have <clears throat> those opportunities. Um, so I think it will, you know, allow people to answer their research questions without having to expend these resources and it will also allow them to replicate studies very precisely, um, which can be really beneficial for your science as well. So that was kind of a lot about what I have experienced. Um, and there were some tips in there, I think, already, but I wanted to um, move on unless you have questions. Uh, but I didn't say that, but you're welcome to just kind of blurt out your question um, if you have any. I um, want to do some tips and tricks about sharing and what you can do when you're starting a new project. Um, and how that might work in your situation. So I'll start a little bit with materials and I'm starting with that because it's probably the easiest thing to share. And why is that? It's because you have most of the materials you use in a project on your computer digitally anyway. So really all you need to do is drag that one folder into a data repository and you're done. It's not quite that easy, but it's almost that easy. 
Um, so what what sh things should you share in the project? Well, basically you need to share anything that someone else might need to replicate your study. So that can be your study protocols, um, any assessments that you used, if you do an intervention, the stimuli you used for this intervention, um, a walkthrough of an intervention about what people are exactly doing, um, specific instructions for smaller parts of a project, um, blank informed consent forms can be very helpful. Um, if you had physical materials, you can use like pictures or descriptions. So I have an example here of um, this is a, a letter board where kids uh, can like put different letters together to make new words. Um, so you can put pictures in there so people can kind of see what that looks like. Um, you can share video or audio footage if you have permission to do so of an intervention to kind of show people what how what an intervention looks like. It can look like something on paper, but it might look different um, in practice. So you could share that. Um, and then anything else you can think of that people might need to replicate your work. Um, and by sharing everything that something someone might need, they could either choose to replicate your work exactly the way you have it, or maybe tweak it a little bit to um, to work better with the situation they are in. So like I said, sharing your materials is super easy because basically you just move that whole folder over from your computer to the cloud. Um, you could either post it to a data repository, um, such as the OSF or Figshare or LDBase. Um, that has the um, benefit of assigning a DOI to your materials so that it's a citable product of your project. Um, and then you can copyright it and then other people can use it even though it's copyrighted and not say, no, you can't use it. Um, you can also choose to put it as supplemental materials um, to your journal article. Um, I prefer putting it in a data repository because it, I have copyright. When you put it as supplemental material in your journal article, you um, put the copyright with the journal. So um, that can be a disadvantage, I think. And also, if the journal is paywalled, then people won't have access to your materials anymore. So that's just, you know, it's your choice, but Personally, I would choose um, data repositories to, to stay within the open science um, movement. So what are some things to think about when you start a project and you want to share your materials? Um, it's a good idea to set up a specific lab notebook where you document your whole workflow and then any deviations from these protocols that you had. Um, this is important to note as you go along because sometimes it's small differences that you won't actually remember later on in the project, but that became really important for people to replicate your work. Um, the second thing is to select what you want to share and have that designated folder on your um, project or your computer or within your big project where you can um, keep these materials and have a clean and formatable copy. So um, with that, I mean, if you share your materials as a TXT file, for example, or an HTML file, you will, um, more people will be able to access and tweak it if you want it to be able to be tweaked. Um, PDFs might work because most people will have a PDF reader and you can get a free PDF reader, um, but it's not adaptable as easy. So if you really want to do more open science stuff, um, use um, so non-proprietary formats such as TXT and HTML. Um, then I do encourage you to get copyright on your materials. Um, 
not so that you can say that you can't share it, but so that you can share it, um, but people will still cite your work. Um, there are a lot of licenses out there that you can use. I don't have very specific knowledge of these licenses, but there are resources on OSF. You know, when you share something, they will ask you, what license do you want? Um, so if you want people to not be able to change it, there's a different license. And if you want people just to cite, but they can change your materials, there are different licenses for that. Um, but it, it just gives you, you know, the option to share your stuff with other people and give them permission to use it while you still keep the original um, rights to your materials. Um, if you have used work of other people, um, and in education, I'm thinking of standardized assessments or other people's assessments, for example, or other people's surveys, you should check the copyright of those materials to see if you're allowed to share them. And you don't actually have to share anything that's publicly available because if you, for example, use the Whitcock Johnson um, tests of achievement, I should be able to get them because they're a free product. Like I have to make, I maybe have to pay a thousand dollars for it, which is sad. But um, you don't have the right to share that on your material page. Um, but I should be able to get that. So if you said, "Oh, I used the Woodcock Johnson," I'm like, "Okay, I can get access to that." So. If it's something that somebody else did, check the copyright to make sure that you have rights to share this with other people. Um, if you used a survey that somebody else made and then you made adaptations, you should make note of those adaptations if you're not allowed to share it so that people at least know what you did differently. Um, and then add your materials to your CV. It has a DOI, it is something that you made, um, and it should be on there so that people can see what you're doing. Um, moving on to code. And with code, what I really mean is an annotated workflow that details all the steps that you took in a statistical analysis that began with the raw data and that ends with the final statistical results. Now, some of you may do qualitative research, which I don't know a whole lot about, but you can also share your code, and, and that might be, uh, I do quotes because I don't mean statistical code and not like I don't value your research. Um, with coding protocol, for example, how did you come up with themes, like that whole process of coding your, um, your data? That could be considered code in qualitative um, research. Um, and if you are a single case researcher, you can um, include like phase change, uh, design decisions. Um, if you have coding for specific behaviors like observational codes, all those, um, all those things. Um, just as with materials, you can share your code by putting it on a data repository that will give you a DOI for your code, which is great. So other people can cite if they want to use your code. Um, and you can also, again, do it as supplemental materials in a journal with the same advantages and disadvantages that I talked about with materials. Um, what should you think about when you share code when you start a project? Uh, the first thing is your choice of analysis environment. Um, sometimes your choice will depend on what type of analysis you're doing, and sometimes it will depend on the availability of different programs. Um, but I think mostly it's um, a personal preference kind of thing. So I prefer to use R because it's an open environment, um, but it doesn't always function the way I want it. Um, and sometimes I have to make analysis decisions um, that I may uh, usually not do, but just because R doesn't have the functionality that I need. Um, for example, in um, LME4, if you do multi-level models, um, it doesn't do full information likelihood, if that makes sense to you, and you have to do multiple imputation, which if you used M+, then you could just do the full. So, you know, it kind of depends on what you want 
which one you choose, what are you most comfortable with, and what can do the functionality that you need. Um, but whichever environment you choose, um, annotating your workflow in details um, is the most important thing. And annotating your workflow is really, really hard. Um, I'll share some examples of code that I did for two projects that's about 10 months apart, and you can see the difference. Um, from when I started to where I finished. Um, and you want to annotate the analysis decisions. So why did you drop a certain variable or why did you de decide to um, change the model a little bit based on you know, outcomes of previous um, analysis, but also on the analysis itself or the code. Like what is this code doing? What step of the analysis are you in here? Um, if the stats program that you're using or, or if you're using a, a different program that doesn't allow you to annotate your code itself, you can get screenshot, screenshots from the different steps that you've taken. I have an example of some Excel screenshots um, that people have done for graphing, for example. Um, and then you want to include details about the software, the version, and the packages that you used um, so that when people want to rerun your analysis, they can do it with those packages um, and with that um, set. Um, and I say this because you know I use R. It updates all the time. And sometimes when it updates, your code doesn't run because now your code is old and stuff changed. But if you said, OK, I ran this on this date with these specific packages, um, then people can you know, evaluate if that worked. Um, but to kind of combat that, I like to share my input and my output um, so that people can see what came out of your analyses and they, they, they don't have to rerun it themselves, but, but they can check what you did to see if it's, if it's right uh, or if they agree with what your decisions um, were. So I promised some example code. This is code I wrote maybe like a year and a half ago. That was my first try. Um, I, I do want to say that I wasn't quite sure if I wanted to share this code, yes or no, because sharing code to me is pretty scary. Because what if I made a mistake and then people will say, you know, that was, why did you do that? Uh, not that everyone, anyone, never, nobody will read my code, but here you are. Um, the code is in white and my annotations are in yellow. And you can see there's just one annotation. It's to get estimates for this model. And I can, I read through it and I kind of understand what I did, but I could have done better with my annotations. So this is my latest one. You can see the increase of my annotations and I have annotations where I say this is the step of the analysis that I'm in and this is what I'm supposed to do. I have notes about some parts of the code, what that did, um, and I have um, decisions that I made based on the outcomes. Um, and to me, this the, the second example is much better because I can go back and now I understand what I did, which sometimes I don't really understand what I did a year ago because I had to Google it probably 500 times and I don't remember. Um, so sharing code and getting code ready to share is really not easy, but you do get better at it as you practice it more often. Um, and here is an example of um, what I said about sharing like Excel files. This is from an article by um, Brian or Aaron Barton and Brian Ryko in 2012, where they teach people how to use Excel to make graphs. And they had these specific screenshots. Um, and you could do this in your own project, like screenshotting things. Um, I think it would be pretty tedious if you had to screenshot every option. Um, but you could also um, kind of write out that workflow if you needed to, if your program doesn't allow for annotations. So what you should you some tips and tips and tricks for sharing code. Um, I would separate your analysis into cleaning code and modeling code, or um, at least select a point where your data is de-identified. 
um, you don't want to share de -identi or identifiable data. Um, and so if you have cleaning code up to de-identification, then you can um, save that data set separately and start your code from there. If you still have to do a lot of cleaning, I would put, I, I prefer personally to do that separately and then have um, a separate code for the analysis itself. Um, you want to confirm if your analysis can be rerun with the data that is provided. So I work in R and then I clear my whole environment and say run and then hopefully everything still works. Um, I think this is a very important step before you share your stuff. Um, and I do this after a while, like I don't look at my code or the analysis for a while, I come back to it and I rerun it and kind of read through it to see if I still understand what I did. And if I don't understand what I did, that means it needs more annotations um, and checking to rerun if everything is still functioning the way um, it's supposed to. I, I suggest over annotating. It's, it's, it is slightly tedious, but you get better at it. Um, and think about the people that might use your code. So think about, you know, past Willa of five years who didn't understand how to do a multi-level structural equation model. And then you read someone's code and it says, oh, you just do this or all you need to do is, and that can be very frustrating and intimidating because I don't know what's going on. It's not just to me. Um, and so kind of thinking about who will read and use your code and adjust your language accordingly. You, you don't have to baby them, but um, coding is scary to a lot of people. And so the more you can do, <laughs> the more you can do to make it less scary, I think is very important. Um, so if those are words you're going to use, you probably need more annotations for other people. I would share my code in um, compatible format. So if you use M plus or SAS, uh, that's great. And you can share that. But if you save it as a TXT file, it means that everyone can open it and read it, even if they don't have M plus or SAS on their computer, which is very helpful. Um, if you work in R, I prefer markdown documents that are shared as HTML files that people can pull up on their um, internet browser. And it has the advantage that it will put your input and your output together. So this is a, just a little example of, I had um, birthdays in some of my data. And so this code shows where I changed the birth date and the test date to age at testing. Um, and this is code that I wouldn't really share with people. Um, and in my markdown um, file, I have it as don't post it. So when it makes it into an HTML file, you actually don't see this part in the code. Um, and then the data that I would share would be um, saved after I did these steps. So that will be totally um, out of the data. But those are things that you should think about when you share your code um, and your data. So maybe the most important part is your data. Um, and I have about 15 minutes, right? I think we can just make it. Um, what should you share? Um, well, it's your raw but curated data set that includes data at the individual level and preferably at the item level. So even if you use a standardized assessment, I would share the answers for each separate item instead of the total score. Because some people might be interested in, um, you know, at item level um, data. Um, you can do two things. You can um, share a subset of your data that is um, connected to a specific analysis or paper that you did. Um, you can also just share all your data, which again is preferable. So all the data that you collected um, in a project. And I want to note that data is not the same as records. So data is your digital data and records are the paper versions of somebody's assessments, for example. So those two are not equal. 
um, but preferable is to share all your data at the item level for your whole project. And then besides your data, you also want to share your metadata, which includes a code book, which I will talk a little bit more about in a, in a second, and other uh, details about your study. So what are what were the aims of your project? Um, what's the information about the sample in your study? Um, what were data collection procedures like? And what about missing data? Um, what does it look like? And this is to help people who want to use your data understand the context of this data, the, these data. I have a question. Yes. Because this is a lot of work to describe this again, and it's already described most likely in the publication. Why do it again? Um, so if your publication is behind a paywall, but you have your data open, then the people that want to use your data may not have access to it. If you have this on a project page, um, so on OSF, for example, or on LD base, when we go live, you can do these descriptions for your project and then attach your data set with it. Um, since you've already had it, it's really not that much work to copy paste it into, you know, a separate something for this either. Um, but it's just, you know, if I have your data and you say, well, this was a treatment group and this was the and this was the control group, then you know, I do want to know what that treatment looked like. So having a little bit extra information there, but yeah, it is a little bit of extra work. Is that actually uh, legally possible, especially when my paper is behind uh, a paywall that I just copy and paste it? <laughs> well, you may want to rephrase some things. Um, yeah, which is why you shouldn't publish behind a paywall and pay the $5,000 it costs to publish open access um, or, do, or do a preprint. But yeah, probably legally don't copy paste, but reword it in some way. Yeah, you're right. Um, what should you do? You should write a consent form for your project that includes statement about sharing your data. This is very important. You should make a data management plan and probably include a data manager in your project if you have funds for that. Um, you need to clean and de-identify your data set. You need to create your metadata, identify the repository you want to um, publish your data at, decide on access restrictions, and then you wanna upload your data in a format that is universal uh, so that everyone can use it. So again, if you upload your data as a SPSS data set, then you know, not everyone wants to pay for SPSS and then, um, it's possible in R to convert that, but it's just easier for everyone if it's in a CSV file, for example. So I'll, I'll go through um, some of these in a little bit more detail. Um, the first one is consent forms. And this is really an, a super important step because this will either not allow you to share your data or allow you to share your data. Um, and I have some very specific language on the next slide um, that you can find in uh, Share in Heart 2020. Um, and on the OSF page, I have all the citations um, too for you in a separate file. Um, but what you want to do in your consent form is have an, a statement um, that indicates that data may be shared with other people. You want to avoid restrictive language. So Restrictive language is a lot I have used a lot in my consent forms before um, saying that uh, these data will only be uh, kept for seven years and uh, accessed by the project uh, PI and affiliated people, which means that you can't share it because other people are not affiliated people to your project and you're basically done. Um, you don't want to do vague language like these data will be kept secure under the extent of the law because the laws in the US are very different than the laws in Europe. Um, 
And even within the U.S., the laws in one state can be very different from the laws in the other state, and laws might change. So what does that mean? So we really, so this is language that I have used in my own consent forms, and now I'm like, oh, well, that was a mistake. Don't don't do that again. Um, and you want to be consistent in this language across people in your project. So if you do have parent consent forms and student consent forms and teacher consent forms, you want to have the same language um, for all these people. So for example, instead of saying all information will be kept for at least seven years in a secure location and only project staff will have access to it, which is very restrictive. Uh, you can say the original paper records and identifiable electronic data will be kept for at least seven years, but data with all identifiers removed may be used for future projects that focus on any topic and may be unrelated to this study. This new data may be, may be made available to the general public via the internet and an open database. So that's example language that works for most IRBs, at least here in the US. Um, but if you're in a different country, you might want to check um, that. But there is language in the Shiro and Hart um, white paper on working with your IRB and writing consent forms. Um, maybe the most daunting and time consuming task is necessary for data sharing is managing your data. Um, I was going to detail a lot of this, but really since I'm running out of time because I'm lengthy as usual. Um, you may want to check out the data management hackathon that happens tomorrow at 10 o'clock with my colleagues Tara Reynolds um, and Chris Schatzneider. And they will tell you all about you know, how to manage your data in a way that is helpful. They also have a white paper out that I've referenced on the citation list. But really, you want to spend a lot of time before you actually collect your data into thinking about how you're going to manage these data. And it will really help you avoid um, getting lost or your data that gets lost, like the actual paper uh, versions of it with data entry mistakes. Um, and you won't have to clean as much later if your entry management system is really good. Um, they have really great tips and tricks that I could spend time on now, but I will just continue with them and I will or continue with my slides and refer you to their um, paper and their hackathon that happens tomorrow. Um, I'm going to do this. <laughs> I'm going to do the same with cleaning and de-identifying. Um, also tomorrow at 11 um, at my, my graduate colleagues Ashley Edwards and Jeffrey Shero are doing a workshop on data de-identification. Um, very shortly, um, you want to remove everything like names, um, social security numbers, if you even have those, birthdays, addresses, and all those things. But there are some other things that people can do to um, re-identify people by using different variables in your um, data set and they can talk to you about um, how you avoid that and what you do. Um, and I think tomorrow they're gonna demonstrate that and help uh, people out if they have problems with the identification. Um, then the metadata. So for your code book, you wanna do um, the names of all the variables with their labels, what the values are, um, what were recoding strategies if you like reverse coded an item maybe for your analysis um, the specifics of a data set what was it uh, if you have a longitudinal um, study what wave was this um, was this teachers only or is it teachers and students um, and there's some really good resources out there like the data documentation initiative that can help you with creating a code book um, but my best tip here is to work with your librarians. There are amazing librarians out there who have so much knowledge about um, open science and data documentation and data um, storage that can really help you out um, in, in getting you set up in the right direction. So the metadata we just kind of talked about. So it's really just details about your data 
um, and your study that other people might want. Then you should check a repository where you want to put your data. Um, and I know in Europe they have pretty heavy restrictions um, or regulations about where you can share your data. Uh, the US is not that picky, apparently. Um, but they're different, <laughs> different. Um, I am from Europe originally, so I do know about all the regulations. Um, there's different like interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary um, repositories. There's discipline specific repositories and grant agencies sometimes have their own repositories as well. So just check out what kind of works with what you want. Um, what would be the audience that works really well for you? I'm going to pitch LD based because I work for them and we're amazing. Um, and we will be live on March 15. Um, but there's different, you know, if you have qualitative data or you have video data, there's more specific repositories that would work for your data. So spend some time in identifying where you want to put your data. Um, so I'm doing great on time. Like I said, I was going to have this whole section on sharing elements from a finished project but I could only come up with one slide and that is it takes a lot of time to share stuff if you've already finished because all the steps that I just talked about and tips of things to do before you start you now have to do afterwards which is time um, and we don't always want to spend that time and so that's something to think about um, you know, going back through your code and annotating your code so other people might understand it or having your data in a shape that you want, you know, doing your metadata and you're like, well, I have to copy and paste from this other document into here. And it's, you know, it's some work. Um, the only thing you really need to pay attention to is your consent forms. So we, I, I talked a little bit about specific language that you need. Um, your old consent forms may not have that language. And that means you can't just share stuff, uh, especially the data. And But you can work with your IRB. Um, sometimes they can give you a waiver um, when you say, well, I want to, I didn't have this in my original consent form, but I want to share this non-identifiable data to have other people look at it. Um, and then sometimes they give you a waiver that says, OK, that's OK. Um, but if you don't get that waiver and you still share your data, um, you will be in trouble. And everything else is just the same. It just takes more time afterwards to get your stuff fixed up in the way that you would want it to be in. And that's it. That's all I have. And it is exactly 12 o'clock. So yay, go me. <laughs> Um, so I have these slides up. Um, I have a thing with citations and I have the examples of my code. And, um, and if you have things that you're like, would like me to find materials for, um, let me know. Um, and I can try and put that on that um, OSF project page. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Philip. I just started to publish uh, results and I found it really helpful. Um, I split my art uh, document, one from the from the raw data to the used data and having this in a special folder so people who are actually not interested in the uh, raw data don't have to go through all of these steps. But I haven't seen that so far, mm -hmm. and I. It really felt natural to me, but I thought maybe there are reasons why they're doing this. So to share. Um, just like summary statistics, is that what you mean? No, um, I have. Uh, I split my art document, so I have one document that just uh, transformed the raw data to the used data, and then another document that just loads the data set from the uh, that, that's the result from the first one, 
and then doing the analysis. Oh, what I said, like difference between cleaning and analysis itself. Um, to me, that, that seems natural to me because that's how I do it. I like to have different markdown things for each one, but I could see that might be confusing for other people. Um, I don't know if there's conventions for that, actually. Yeah, to me, that would make total sense. But yeah, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> I think you did the right thing. Um, I would have one question, maybe a bit uh, specific, but I would be curious uh, whether you have any recommendations for like generating machine readable metadata such in R, so such as code book package, data mate or data spice. I mean, there are several out there. What, what would you recommend or are you using any of them? I'm not using any of those. Um... I've looked at the codebook package. Um, it didn't really do what I wanted it to do, I think, because it's more like this is the variable, this is the label, and here's like a range of values is kind of what I got out of it. Um, there are, oh, I don't know on the top of my head, but there are some really good codebooks out there. Um, actually, the study that I was mentioning earlier, the National Center for Teacher Effectiveness in Math had a really good code book. Um, yeah, I haven't really dabbled around with it a lot. Um, would that be uh, like uh, findable, like machine readable? Uh, because that's it, what I liked about yeah, the code. Yeah, it's actually page, just it's... a PDF, so not really. Okay. Uh, um, I think that I ooh, maybe that Data Alliance has some more information on that because I have been reading about it. I just haven't tried it yet because I use secondary data, so I just get people's code book and use those. Okay. Yeah, it was a very specific question. Sorry. Yeah, no, it's a it's a great question. Um, if you go to the uh, data de-identification, what well, you should ask Ashley Edwards because she's done a lot more looking into that too. Just don't tell her I tell that I told you to. I have just a really small question um, as well. First of all, thanks so much for this talk. It was it was really great. Um, something that you said that I never really considered before was putting um, your shareable materials on your CV. And I'm not sure that I've really seen that, but I think that's lovely and brilliant. And I'm just wondering if you have um, any more feedback or advice about like where that would go, whether it would go right mm -hmm. underneath the publication or if you have any examples that would be helpful in um, seeing what what an example of that would look like um the way i think about it and i haven't i haven't actually shared any materials to put on my cv sadly um what i've seen people on twitter do is have the different sections so have an um you know open materials like below your publications have like open materials, open code, open data, and have kind of that same structure. Um, and maybe have the um, badges. I've also seen people put badges behind their publication, like this is open access, this is open code, and then you can link back to that next section. I personally, that's I think how I would approach it, where like this is material that I have um, shared. Great, thanks. Are there any more questions? I know it's it's lunchtime here, it's dinner time in in Germany. I saw a lot of people from Germany. No? All right. 
Well, thank you guys so much for coming um, and keeping your video on and nodding from time to time. It's very <laughs> encouraging when you're staring over Zoom. Um, so again, you can find me on Twitter um, at Willa Van Dyke. Um, and if you want to email me, it's W Van Dyke, my last name, at fsu.edu. And I can put that in the chat. Oh, there's all kinds of, sorry, I didn't actually look at the chat because apparently I'm not great at Zoom. <laughs>